Good morning and welcome to the 22nd meeting of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee in 2017. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should ensure that they're switched to silent. Apologies have been received uh, from Jackson Carlaw and I welcome Dean Lockhart to the committee as Mr Carlaw's substitute. Our first item of business today is a decision on taking agenda item four in private. Are members content? Yes. Our second item of business today is an evidence session on European structural funds with the Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Jobs and Fair Work. I'd like to welcome to the meeting Keith Brown, the Cabinet Secretary, David Anderson, Head of European Structural Funds State Aid Division, and George Burgess, Deputy Director of Food, Drink and Trade with the Scottish Government. And I'd like to begin by inviting the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement. Thank you very much, Convener. Thanks for the invitation to come along. I will concentrate, first of all, on the structural funds, but a few words at the end about the uh, hubs uh, issue which has been raised. So, European structural investment funds represent around one-third of the EU's annual budget, and they, as members will know, provide key support to the Scottish economy through the uh, ERDF and European Social Fund programmes. And Scotland's benefited from these programmes since joining the European Union, and the funding has supported projects right across Scotland, uh, whilst contributing to our ambitions as set out in the programme for government. So during the current programming period from 2014 to 2020, Scotland is scheduled to receive €944 million Euro as part of the ESF and ERDF programmes. And that investment has been designed to support smart, sustainable, inclusive growth in line with Scottish and European priorities. The ERDF programme, um, so the European Regional Development Programme, is supporting innovative and potentially transformative projects through £33 million uh, being awarded to the Low Carbon Transition Infrastructure Programme to support projects across Scotland. That will bring forward low carbon uh, demonstrator projects that aim to stimulate commercial interest and investment and also to maximise Scotland's vast potential in the low carbon sector whilst, of course, contributing to positive progress in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Another area where we're seeing exciting work is in relation to the Zero Waste uh, Scotland programme, where £30 million has been provided to support the uh, resource-efficient circular economy that stimulates new business activity, especially in the SME sector. Uh, this invests in SMEs which are creating this, uh, or helping to create the circular economy and includes cutting-edge projects that will develop new high-value markets which, for example, I'm sure this will be of interest to uh, Mr Lockhead in particular, reuse whisky byproducts, uh, waste plastic and household furniture. And each of those will draw on further private investment that will accelerate our circular economy ambitions. They will create jobs in skilled, uh, skilled jobs in urban and rural communities and also contribute to our action on climate change. ERDF funding is focused on supporting SMEs, which represent 95% of all Scottish businesses, helping boost economic growth. And the SME Holding Fund will give companies access to funding to help transform their innovative ideas into economic success stories. It also aims to create 2,000 jobs, which form a key plank of the Scottish growth scheme. And that's supported by £50 million from EU funds. Uh, on top of all that, we've allocated £20 million in grant to extending world-class digital connectivity to those parts of the Highlands and Islands that will not be served commercially or by existing public sector investment programmes with a particular focus on remote island communities. And that will help contribute towards the Scottish Government's national priority to deliver 100% superfast broadband access by 2021. In relation to the European Social Fund, uh, the work here is to support those most removed from the workplace by providing intensive support to help remove the barriers they face to entering sustainable employment or progressing into better employment. Uh, and the projects approved to date uh, are targeting those areas. And as well as that traditional type of support, the Social Fund is also looking to support social inclusion and combat poverty and discrimination. So projects such as the Shetland Islands Council Fuel Poverty Service are working with the most disadvantaged individuals and households providing fuel poverty and support. Others are focusing on financial and debt advice as well as access to childcare. The Scottish Government's Aspiring Communities Fund will help enable community bodies and third sector organisations in our most deprived and fragile communities to develop and deliver long term local solutions that address local priorities and needs. And that should increase active inclusion and build on the assets of local communities to reduce poverty and to enable inclusive growth. 
£27.5 million pounds has been awarded to the Developing Scotland's Workforce Initiative, providing funds to Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Funding Council to support the delivery of higher level qualifications aligned with the needs of growth industries and sectors in Scotland. And that includes extending the Modern Apprenticeship Programme, creating new links to sectors including science, technology, engineering and mathematics. And they're also creating a new work-based learning approach through foundation apprenticeships where activity starts at school and uses a mixture of academic and work-based learning. Finally, the Youth Employment Initiative in the southwest of Scotland saw nearly £60 million committed to address the 25.8% who at that stage were unemployed. Uh, since the initiative was approved, though, the actions that the government has taken, including the uh, YE, the Youth Employment Initiative, have seen the youth un unemployment rate fall to 12.7%. That's uh, more than a 50% reduction and substantially below that in the rest of the UK. It was, I think, the third lowest in the EU, now the sixth lowest, as other economies have been catching up. Uh, the Scottish Government allocated funding in two phases, allowing for a mid-term review to allow for changes in priorities or approach. And to date, 203 operations, I know this was the basis, I think, of the request to come to the committee, 203 operations have been approved, with £395 million of grant committed to these operations. Based on current exchange rates, and that's one of the big issues we're uh, wrestling with, um, that represents around 45% of the programme. Uh, and taking into account match funding, this represents a very substantial investment at a time when public spending budgets are under pressure. The ERDF programmes will support 16,000 SMEs to grow, 750 enterprises introduce new products, and 3,000 low-carbon resource efficiency and circular economy projects, whilst ESF programmes will support 77,000 individuals with multiple barriers to employment. 15,000 disadvantaged people and 17,000 people with lower levels of skills. Uh, Her Majesty's Treasury have guaranteed EU funds to projects approved before the UK leaves the EU, whilst the Scottish Government has confirmed that we will pass on the current UK Government guarantees in full to Scottish stakeholders to provide stability and certainty for these key sectors of the Scottish economy. We still, though, have no clarity from the UK Government on the operation of these guarantees following the date of Brexit. And it's worth pointing out, I think, since last Friday, the speech made by the Prime Minister in Florence, which highlighted a potential two-year uh, transition period. Now, that may well be good for other reasons, but it does increase the uncertainty, um, throws things substantially up in the air. And so I'm seeking a clarification urgently from the UK Government on what this means for uh, European funding in order to bring around clarity for those that are currently involved in it. Um, just very quickly, if I could, uh, convener, to mention in relation to trade hubs, I know the committee is interested in. This is uh, part of our programme to expand our presence in Europe. It's essential to protecting our place in Europe and we'll continue to do what we can to protect our interests during the UK negotiations to leave the European Union. And we have to continue to assist businesses to internationalise to help boost our export performance and continue to attract record amounts of inward investment. So we've established innovation and investment hubs in Dublin, Brussels and London. And we're currently in the process of establishing hubs in Berlin and Paris. And that will support the wider work across government, partners and businesses to support trade, investment, innovation and intergovernmental relations with Europe. And primarily, they'll provide a platform for collaborative activity to increase exports and attract investment to Scotland. Each hub is different. It's tailored to the opportunities present in the market in which it's located. But they also cover broader economic opportunities, such as the development of collaborations and research partnerships and work to support funding for innovation and research in Scotland. And as I said to the SCDI yesterday, we cannot simply wait to get through the process of Brexit. We have to try and maximise the opportunities in the meantime. And thank you for the chance to make the opening statement, Convener. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, you've outlined some really vital areas that these funds cover, like foundation apprenticeships, uh, youth unemployment, the circular economy, low carbon technologies. What is going to fill the gap? What is going to replace these current programmes once they're finished? Well, I think that goes to the point that I was just trying to make about uh, trying to find out where Brexit is taking us, whether it's a transitional period, what the impact of the UK government's guarantee is in funding um, through that transitional period. There's still uncertainty as to 
whether the transition period will happen, whether it will be for two years, whether it will be for four years, and what the impact on European funding will be. So much of what we'd want to do, to go to your question, will depend on the available resources, and we don't have a clear picture on what those resources will currently be. There is, however, an announcement by the UK Government on a shared prosperity fund, which we are assuming will be used for these purposes. But again, there's very little clarity on that. And given we're 18 months away, uh, potentially, from exiting the EU, we really do need to have clarity. And we've asked the UK government if we, the Scottish government, and the other devolved administrations can be involved in developing that fund, if it's going to be the vital measure by which we replace the European funding, then we have to know more about it and know it quite quickly. Have there been actual discussions with UK government counterparts, um, you know, for example, the recent discussions at ministerial level? Has that touched on future frameworks for the funding of regional development programmes? Uh, well, that was carried out by uh, the Deputy First Minister and by Mike Russell, as you know, um, with Damien Green and David Mundell, and that centred on my understanding from having heard back from Mike Russell is the 111 areas that were talked about, which does touch upon those areas, but not, not in any great depth. And it certainly didn't provide any clarity, the discussions which took place on what the future direction would be of European funding or its potential replacements. Right. Um, can I ask, in terms of the, the funds at, at the moment that you're managing, what's been the impact of the, um, the falling value of the pound on those structural funds? Uh, well, it's quite a complex um, um, impact. There have been two downsides to it, one upside to it. Um, if you think about the value of the pound, and we could give you the details on, at the point of 2014, the change there has been in the value of the pound in relation to the euro, it does really um, substantially present problems with how we uh, profile the spend. So if you suddenly have a larger amount of um, pounds to spend, uh, and you have to spend to the level of the euros that were allocated in the first place, then you do have to sometimes try and change um, the programmes which are there to make sure you get as much of the allocation as you can. But changing the amount of the quantum available during the course of the um, the period, the six-year period, does present difficulties. And maybe if I could ask David Anderson to say a couple of words sure. about that, Convener. Certainly. Um, when the funds were first started, the 940 or so million euros was worth about 750 million pounds. Because of the change in the exchange rates, that's now worth around 870 million pounds. So again, that increase. Um, at one level, as the Cabinet Secretary says, that's at face value a good thing because there's more money available to us. Clearly then we have to look for schemes that can be match funded and we are currently doing a number of things, one of which is looking at changing the intervention rate, which is the level of match funding we seek, particularly in the Highlands and Islands. So we're looking to increase the amount of money we can put in from structural funds up to around 70%, which reduces the amount of money that match comes from the local authorities and the partners. So hopefully this will bring more schemes forward. The other aspect to it, and the downside, as the Cabinet Secretary refers to, is that the spend profiles were set out in 2014 and they were set out in euros. So those have also gone up at the same time. So the, the matter of how, trying to get the money spent is becoming challenging. And there are not, so again, it, it, it's a kind of two-sided two coin. Thank you very much. I'll just bring in Lewis Macdonald now. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask Cabinet Secretary about uh, underfunded or unclaimed allocations. Uh, your letter to the convener this week says that on the 2017 to 13 programme, there was a, a total of 740 million euros claimed. The figures we had from our predecessor committee five years ago was that the Scottish programmes were allocated 798 million euros. Does that mean that there's been a funding shortfall uh, of 58 million, as it appears to. So do you mean a funding shortfall? Money or that allocation to Scottish programmes that was not taken up by... Right. Uh, yes, there was monies that weren't taken of, up. Of, of to, that order. Well, I'd have to give you the exact figures on that, uh, which you can do. We'll provide that to the committee. But yes, that is the case. And that does happen when the eligibility criteria are not met by some of the partners. It happens as well when the nature of the scheme over the six-year period changes. And also, there's a case that, uh, as you, I think, know very well, and the committee will know, uh, issues in terms of suspension of some programmes because the uh, audit data was not provided in the form that was required sure. by the EU. So a number of factors did contribute to that, and it does happen. Uh, I think 
the shortfall, I think I'm right in saying, again, I would check this, was substantially less in Scotland than it was in the UK, but it is a feature of these programmes across Europe. And obviously what we try to do is to minimise that difference between what can be taken. So, so, so what, what would you assess the level of risk to be in the current programme? Uh, well, I, I, obviously we're at an earlier stage of the current mm -hmm. programme, but the actions that we've taken, so for example, having reduced the number of partners from about 700 down to about 200 or thereabouts... Uh, if I may, so it's from 200 down to 45. All oh, right, well, I'd figure off, well, we've substantially reduced that. So there are bigger programmes, but fewer of them, and that should help with some of the audit requirements. Plus, I think there's a much better understanding among some of the partners now that we will not get this money back from Europe unless we can provide the audit data that's required. The risk uh, that you refer to lies with the Scottish Government in the first instance, because obviously the claims will come into us and they, we then claim it back from the EU. If they don't provide us with that money, then the liability rests in the first instance with the Scottish Government. But by doing what we've done in terms of recovering uh, or seeking to recover the shortfalls because of the lack of information or non-compliance, some of that will fall back onto the partners themselves. And I think there's a much greater awareness of, not least because of that process that we've just gone through for the previous uh, funding round. So I think those things help to minimise the risk yeah. that we have this time. The, the since the, compared with the previous funding round, this funding round, there's an additional European Commission requirement, the N plus three rule, which mm -hmm. means that if you haven't, if you've been allocated money in 2014 and you haven't spent it by the end of 2017, then that money is lost. How much is that? How much is at risk in that uh, uh, for non for monies that are not committed by the end of 2017? I don't think it's possible to put a figure on that. What we're trying to do is to work in the ways which I've mentioned in terms of not just having set um, the programme in a different way with fewer partners involved in it, and sometimes you had some very small organisations trying to cope with a quite a large auditing requirement. Uh, so we are trying to ma uh, minimise that in the meantime, to minimise the risk. I'm not sure if we can put a figure on that at this stage of the process, the N3. Previously, of course, it was the N2. I'm not sure we could put a figure on that at this stage. Presumably, though, you'll know whether we're talking a risk of millions or tens of millions. What's the, what's the ballpark area of risk? Uh, under N plus three for this. If, if I may, and back at what the Cabinet Secretary is saying, is what the team we're currently working very, very hard to is get those claims in. Because what we do is we claim from the European Commission, as you've correctly said, by the end of 2017. So we are right in the middle of getting claims in from lead partners, processing those claims such that we can then claim. Now, as, as, as the Cabinet Secretary said, we've committed 395 million. Not all that money has been spent. That money is profiled to be spent out to the end of 2018, perhaps into 2019. Um, but what we are doing is working very closely with those lead partners to get as much of that funding out as we can. So I'm afraid I can't give you that detail, um, but I can assure you we're working very hard to keep it to a small possible number. Should, should we be very concerned that there's less than 40% commitment on European social fund at this stage, less than 50% on ERDF when we're already halfway through the programme? I, I think if I may, on, on that one, it's, it's the point, um, as the Cabinet Secretary said, is that when we designed the programmes, we always um, intended that we would commit approximately 50% of the programmes in the first phase, and that should Brexit not have been um, brought forward, we would, at about this time, be looking to commit the second phase. That's very different to the other managing authorities across the UK. They committed funds for the entire programme at the very beginning, but we decided to put in half the funds, approximately, take stock and then commit the second half. And we've effectively, that's exactly what we've done. And the point, as you make in terms of the European social funding being below 40%, that's due to two factors, one of which is due to some local authorities choosing not to take up their full allocation, but also the exchange rate um, changes, which actually has changed that percentage um, take up by around six percentage points. It's dropped it significantly. So. We are working very hard to ensure that we get phase two out the door. I, I mean, clearly from what you're describing, if, if some of the lead partners are not uh, coming forward and taking up those allocations, there must be an issue for them too in terms of being able to provide the match funding. I, I'm simply keen to understand how much potential European funding we may not receive uh, as a result of, of these programme issues. Well, one area where there's probably more certainty is in relation to the youth employment initiative because there are changes there and also if you reduce youth uh, unemployment from 25 plus down to 12 plus there's less scope um, to take up the slack in relation to it. it's been substantial progress but I think we we could probably come back to the committee in writing with a, a greater clarity around where the 
um, the likelihood of not being able to spend the entire entitlement would relate to that. But the rest of it, I think, is, as David Anderson's just said, we're not looking not to draw down the other funds. We're working very hard to make sure that we can do that. We're not alarmed by the 40%. That's pretty much where we expected to be at this stage. Um, but I think there are particular circumstances in relation to YEE, and I'm happy to come back to the committee with detail on that. That's very helpful. Could you also come back to the committee regarding the N plus three by the, at the end of 2017 and let us know how much, if anything, has, been, has, has not uh, been drawn down? As a happy to do that, yep. that Rachel Hamilton. Morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I just wondered uh, if you'd be able to tell the committee um, whether you're confident that you'll be able to recover um, the, the outstanding amount of uh, money of, for those projects that had high error rates. And I noticed that um, in, our, in our briefing that the, the error rates were from missing documentation and procurement processing errors. I mean, how does this, how does this happen with such a huge amount of money and such a huge amount of commitment? Well, first of all, because there's... Part of the answer lies in a huge number of projects in different organisations of very different sizes. Um, now the error rates that we had were pretty, I think, typical across Europe. Um, and quite rightly, the Commission has come back and said, no, we can't accept these. Um, and going back to the previous question asked by Lewis MacDonald, despite all the actions that we are taking, we had one claim came in with a 20% error rate. It was pretty unusual in this current round. So that is still happening on a much less frequent basis. Um, but what we are seeing are the different organisations that are involved now, mainly because of the fact, I think, it's led to local authorities and they have the resource to do the auditing and the accounting that's uh, necessary for it and are used to doing it in relation to European funding. But I think the answer lies to your question in uh, the proliferation of organisations that were involved and the lack of capacity, especially in some of the smaller ones, to carry out the necessary auditing. And sometimes, more than that, I have to say, there was a disregard for the requirements that were laid down at the start of the programme on the part of those organisations. And that's why we're seeking to recover the money. And the other part of your question is about how we go about doing that. So we've talked to all the organisations involved, uh, raised invoices um, to them, uh, and you'll be aware from the Parliament's... Um, I forget the name of the committee now that looked at this public audit, I think it was. Um, in some cases, if it's below £250, it's not worth going after that level of um, recovery. But in areas where it's more than that, um, we are doing that. And we've explained quite sensitive areas. The committee's own letter to me uh, made clear um, but we've tried to talk to the organisations where it represents a substantial amount of resource and try and work them through it. And we're in the middle of that process now. And I, I think we've a, I think about a third of it's been collected already and we expect to be substantially above that. Okay, thank you. My second question is um, that in the programme review, firstly, um, who did the programme review? And secondly, um, you, um, you were going to implement a number of technical changes to those mm. programmes. And the one thing I was particularly interested in was a change to the scope of the programme for uh, the culture and heritage activities in the Highlands and Islands, um, particularly with an emphasis on SME growth. I just wondered if you could talk us through yeah. that. Um, I guess that one's coming my way. <laughs> um, the technical changes... Um, the, te te the technical changes here are actually about trying to address the point that Mr. MacDonald was making earlier. This is about trying to get the better absorption. Clearly, projects in the Highland Islands often face more challenging um, issues in being brought forward. Um, so what we have been working with the Commission is to, um, and actually, we've been working with the Commission to um, say, well, we want to make these changes. And that change has been saying is there is a demand. Now, we've understood that demand from talking to the likes of Highlands Islands Enterprise and others in the Highlands Islands area and saying, look, if we could change the rules slightly, we have a stream of projects that we could bring forward to for seek funding. So that's one of the reasons for bringing them in. Um, the other part to that um, is that we've also then sought to increase the intervention rate such that the amount of European money we can bring to it is higher, um, up to potentially 70%. So the amount of match funding that has to be brought by the local authorities uh, and the partners is less. So that, that's, again, helpful. As to the actual review itself, it was carried out by my team. I chaired the steering group. The steering group itself, we had representatives from um, the um, Highlands Alliance Enterprise, we had mem representation from the third sector, uh, and we had representation from Slade as well, the local authority um, chief ex economic um, development 
um, staff. So the actual work was carried out, but it was carried out in consultation with all of the lead partners, and we issued a number of calls for evidence and information to be provided. So we've got, we feel we've got a pretty good tone back from those who are in receipt of structural funding to see where this is going. And again, it comes back to the point that Mr. McDonald was making is a number of those people were saying is um, match funding is harder because often these are discretionary funds, the projects that these are supporting uh, are being supported in different ways. So um, what we're looking to do as well is to extend a number of projects to allow them perhaps to deliver a slightly longer time scale, uh, and that hopefully will make them more deliverable. I should say, though, that um, we are, the pro when the program, the program often focuses on the money, but the programs themselves also have performance targets related to them, and the Cabinet Secretary has outlined some of those here, like the number of people supported, the number of projects delivered, uh, and what we have to keep an eye on is the amount of money spent versus the actual delivery against those targets. Okay, thank you. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I know that ESF money uh, is uh, extremely important. Uh, I benefited from it 20 years ago at university. Um, but uh, certainly going forward, uh, you mentioned the issue of uh, Brexit. And uh, the UK is due to come out of the EU uh, in 2019. Uh, so, uh, and this funding round goes up to 2020. Uh, will there be a change of process between 2019 and 20 for any applications? I think that's exactly the um, uncertainty that I was trying to highlight earlier on. Um, and if you look at the current discussions on Brexit, there's discussion now about well, Article 50, which I know the committee is going to discuss, the requirement to leave uh, in March 2019. Uh, as I say, the UK government has given a commitment that all uh, funding committed to um, prior to us exiting the EU would be honoured, and we've said in turn that we'll pass that on. But what happens after that? What is the status after, um, if there's a two-year transition period, is unclear. What is the status of the Shared Prosperity Fund, which we understand, and again, it's not absolutely confirmed, would be, uh, perhaps amongst other things, the UK's measure by which they would uh, provide regional aid in trying to reduce inequalities across... The, well, they've said it is to try and reduce inequalities across the UK, but to what extent that would um, uh, replace uh, what has um, been paid just now. Now, I think, if you go back and history in the 1980s, you saw a massive contraction of regional aid in the UK, which centred very much on the Midlands of England. And European funding came in at that stage and has been an absolute lifeline, especially to places like the Highlands, but also to Wales as well. And if that's going, there's a real question mark about what the commitment's going to be to, um, for, better, for want of a better term, regional aid in those other parts of the UK. The UK is one of the most unbalanced and unequal economies in the world, and it needs to have strong measures to counteract that. And we need to have, given the fact that we're uh, less than 18 months away from a potential exit, uh, we need to have more clarity because, as has been evidenced by some of the questions that have been asked already, there's a long lead-in time to these things, and people need to have some degree of um, certainty about the framework in which they're going to operate. So I think you've highlighted... I can't answer the question that you've asked. I don't know what the arrangements are going to be because so much is uncertain in terms of Brexit and any transition period. And if there is a transition period, what that means for things like European funding. OK, well, thank you for that. Uh, just my second question. It's on, just on the hubs. Mm -hmm. um, it could be argued that the hubs are probably more uh, necessary now because we are leaving the, uh, the European Union. Uh, was that part of the thinking of the Scottish Government? Uh, yes, it is. Um, and uh, ha having visited uh, Berlin, where we are establishing a new hub um, shortly, we have hubs. Well, we have uh, offices elsewhere in Germany, for example, in Dusseldorf. But just from the visit to Germany, on which we took the Chambers of Commerce with us, it's quite clear there have not been the connections made that should have been made. Um, in terms of taking up the opportunities with direct contact with German industry uh, and the German economy. Uh, for example, the Chambers of Commerce who came with us on that have tapped into the, their equivalent in, in Germany, but also the two other massive employers' organisations which operate there for the first time. Um, and it was quite clear that direct um, contact, so we met with um, senior politicians from each of the, the major federal parties uh, at the British Ambassador's uh, residence, it's quite clear there's a real appetite in Germany to continue doing business um, uh, with Scotland. Uh, we also went to Hamburg and saw, for example, the, the port that's there, which is nearly all automated, but so much goods go through Hamburg, um, it's extremely important to the UK and to Scotland. 
But they are also very concerned, not so much in Germany with, um, they are concerned about tariffs, but they're much more concerned about the bureaucracy which might attach itself to the UK's relationship with Germany and with the EU. That it's vitally important to have these discussions and also to raise the profile of Scotland. I have said to Liam Fox uh, when I met him uh, a while back now, I'll meet him again shortly, that the Scottish Government is perfectly happy to work within the network of the, uh, the UK's representation around the world, which is a phenomenal network. But increasingly, my experience is Scotland, and for that matter, Wales, Northern Ireland, Northern England, do not get represented effectively at that level. I continue to say, if you do represent us effectively, then we're happy to work with that. But if we don't, and even if we do, we still have to do uh, as much as we can to uh, emphasise the uh, the opportunities that there are for Scotland dealing with these countries. So that, for that reason, you're, you're quite right. London, uh, the hub that we have there, we've got, um, and, and London is hugely important, and it's a global crossroads for investment. It's hugely important. We now have around 750 businesses expressing an interest in the hub. 160, I think it is, members of that hub. It's on the embankment in London. In fact, it might be worth a committee convener looking into that, and, 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 and if you get a chance to go to it, it's... Last week, I met with the Chinese ambassador at dinner, and he's offered to uh, bring the, all the big Chinese companies uh, operating in the UK, based in London and elsewhere, to come to that hub for events about investment in Scotland. So, yes, we do have to do these things and represent Scotland's interests. It's, it's my view that we do, and that's why the First Minister committed to the expansion of the hubs in the EU. Uh, just you mentioned the, the Berlin hub uh, and it's the, with the Chamber, Scottish Chambers of Commerce and the, the first time connections have been made. What has, why has the, uh, that particular um, uh, UK trade uh, facility not actually uh, done this before? What's, why have they just sat there and done nothing? Well, I, I, yeah, I think well, I should first of all say that the Scottish Chambers of Commerce with the British Chambers of Commerce do have a network which they operate mm -hmm. and they have connections. It was because of those connections that we've given particular resource the Scottish Government has to the Scottish Chambers of Commerce to make sure we can use that to best effect for Scotland PLC, if you like. But when I said it was the first time that connection had been made, there's a particular location in Berlin where you have... It's different there because all companies are obliged to contribute to their equivalent of the CBI, if you like, um, legally obliged. And it's an immensely wealthy, powerful organisation which sits with two other organisations, including the Chamber of Commerce. And that direct contact hadn't been made, uh, Chambers of Commerce tell me. So I think it's very important. Maybe, maybe the prospect or threats of Brexit has meant that people are rapidly seeing what is, what's going to have to be done to, to fill the void. OK, thank you. Marie Cushon. Uh, thank you, convener. I really just wanted to know why uh, you decided on the the hub model for that, uh, and yeah, how the thinking, what was the thinking behind that? Uh, well, I suppose it was different in different places. Currently in London, and I'll, I'll get George Burgess to come in on this. Currently in London, we were based in Dover House, and so shared with the UK government. And it wasn't the place for us to carry out the kind of activities that we wanted to carry out. If you do get the chance to go to the hub that's been established in London, it's in a, a Nesta building right on the embankment. You'll see the different resources that we can use and the facilities that are there, um, drop-in points for people and businesses to use. So we needed to have that facility there. In terms of Berlin, it was about the inter governmental relationship as well. Um, so Dusseldorf is, is uh, a key for manufacturing and um, Berlin more for tourism and intergovernmental affairs. And also Germany, I think I'm right in saying, is about the third highest investor in Scotland. It's very important uh, to us and obviously the most powerful economy in the EU. So that explained that one. Uh, in terms of Dublin, we are sharing with the British Embassy there. It seems to be working quite well at this stage, so we're happy to do that. It's not an ideological thing. We will work uh, in the best circumstance. But, but you're right, I think, if your question suggests that this, because of Brexit and some of the uncertainty, that we have to up our presence, and that was the underlying philosophy, but it might be useful for George Burgess to talk more about that. Yes, I think the Cabinet Secretary has really captured it. It's that bringing together of the... The, sort of the, the government, so Scottish government and sort of diplomatic and uh, institutional links with business links through uh, Scottish Development in International, so the, the hub in London, uh, as well as the many businesses that are already signed up to be members and will be able to use the facilities there, the, the back office space brings together uh, Scottish Government, Scottish Development International, Visit Scotland and, and other players like that. If we look across at the, the Brussels hub now, Committee, committee will be aware that for many years we have had Scotland House and Scotland Europa 
operating in Brussels from the same building. Uh, and they've worked very closely together, but there's a bit of a physical separation within that building that has been a little bit of a, a limitation on them. So the work that is uh, taking place there will actually bring the teams there physically together, improve the integration between uh, those, uh, those, those two uh, op operations in, in, in Brussels. Looking ahead to uh, Paris, we already have a substantial SDI team based there, but no Scottish Government presence. So what we'll be doing is adding Scottish Government presence to the existing SDI team and getting more than we, we already get from the, the, the work of SDI there. Thank you. And how effective, uh, given the hubs that have, that have opened already and are currently operating, how effective would you say uh, they've been so far in doing what they were established to do? And uh, are you able to give any ex examples of the outcomes that have been achieved so far? Well, I think uh, in relation to London, the examples I would give are those companies which have signed up to it already. Um, and if you think of all, even just the major investment conferences like MIPIM, which happen happen in um, London and in Cannes, uh, it's certainly easier to go to London than it is to Cannes um, and get away with it. Um, some local authority leaders have found. Um, so I think it's, it, that that uh, can be evidenced by the number of the, the level of interest there is there. That's 700. Um, plus companies and some take up membership which costs them money and helps defray the cost for us in establishing it in the first place. So I think that level of interest has shown that's been very effective. I think in relation to the Dublin hub I hear very positive reports about it and that um, it derives I think in, in part from the staff that are there uh, working in that hub but the connections that they've made and it might surprise people to learn um, sometimes for the first time some of the connections that we've made with um, businesses uh, and economic interests in, in, in Ireland through the use of that hub. The other ones, um, you know, Paris not yet established, Berlin uh, not established as yet as well. It's, it's more difficult to point to uh, things which are done there. But in relation to the Berlin hub, it was just evident to me from the visit we had about the potential for that hub, um, huge potential. So that, those are the things I would mention as, as examples of how they're working. Uh, maybe just if I can add some of the very specific examples from the, the, the Dublin hub, and that at the moment, John Webster is our uh, head of the, the hub there. There's a small team at the moment, two and a half uh, staff equivalent in, in total. So they have worked with the Irish government, and there's a, there's a partnership between them to create this sort of Scottish-Irish business network, who have hold, held, already held a number of events, both in Ireland and in Scotland. They've been working with Strathclyde University, University College Dublin and business organisations uh, on a project in relation to collaboration between the financial sectors and actually there's a conference coming up in the middle of October that uh, Mr Mackay will be, will be speaking at. Um, I think there are also uh, a number of foreign direct investment projects that have been chalked up as a success that relates at least in part to the work of the hub. That's helped to create or safeguard 295 jobs so far, uh, of which 10 are high value added, uh, and also has seen a further F5 FDI projects landed, which have created 456 jobs. Again, we can provide these details to the committee. So, and that's just in relation to the Irish um, uh, Dublin hub so far. Okay, thank you. Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you. Uh, morning, Cabinet Secretary. I wanted to follow up on something you mentioned in your opening statement. Uh, you mentioned that there will be some European funding available for the growth scheme. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand that's going to be in the form of uh, equity funding. Um, I wonder if you could uh, explain how um, business in Scotland could apply to access this funding and who would, will decide which businesses are eligible and allocated funding under this uh, European funding? Uh, well, yes. First of all, there will be two elements to the, if you like, the eligibility. The eligibility will be dependent upon the conditions laid down by the EU when they've made this funding available. Uh, people can get in touch with probably any arm of the Scottish Government if they want to get in touch, but they can also do that through uh, Scottish Enterprise uh, or SDI uh, or indeed, as I say, any parts of of the government to get directed to the right place. Um, and it's around £50 million, as, uh, as has been mentioned already, which is a part of the growth scheme, not the whole amount. Um, and it's intended uh, to try and uh, help those, especially SMEs, to grow. Um, I, I don't know if, if that answers all the parts of the question. Or is it... 
it, 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 it almost does. It, I guess the final part is um, who decides um, how to allocate the funding and the terms of the funding. I, I looked at the Scottish Enterprise website and it looks like it will be the equity fund that decides uh, which businesses in Scotland get to access the funding and the, and the terms of that access. Is, is that understanding correct? Uh, well, I'm happy to provide the exact process which uh, companies, if, if your question arises from Possibly your own experience that there's some confusion out there, then that's an issue we have to address. So I'm happy to give the committee all the uh, information a, a, around the applicability of it. But yes, the, that's how it will be decided, but it's decided upon uh, by the eligibility criteria laid down by the EU. And given that it's part of the growth, the larger growth fund, as, as you'll understand, uh, obviously we apply our own um, a priority to particular areas, and in particular the £50 million uh, um, section of the, the funding that's to be applied here. But I'm happy to um, uh, give you more detail. And if you're aware that there is some confusion or lack of understanding amongst the SME sector out there, then again, if you let me know, we'll do what we can to make sure that confusion is cleared up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ross Greer? Thanks, uh, Convener. On the face of it, there seems to be perfectly compelling reasons to open new hubs all over the place, you know, in the emerging economies, for example. But <clears throat> what is the formal process for assessing the impact, the success of existing hubs and the process for deciding where and whether to open new ones? It, well, I'll, I'll let uh, George uh, Burgess come in here as well. But I think from our point of view, I've just mentioned some of the achievements so far in the very early stages of the Dublin hub. And of course, over time, you want to assess whether these things are making an impact. There's an assessment made of the market. There's an assessment made of the uh, geography assessment made of how close it is to another hub which might serve that market equally well. All these things are taken into account and going back to the questions which Stuart McMillan answered, there is uh, underlying the EU hubs, not just in terms of the hubs, but in terms of our commitment to double the number of SDI stuff, uh, staff working in the EU, is a recognition about the particular challenges we have in the EU. So uh, our current export performance and what we believe is a potential export performance with the EU underlies that. I should also say that there is an assessment going on currently uh, within SDI about the non-EU hubs as well. So we do assess these things and review them on a regular basis, and that's being carried out on the wider network right now. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, George. I, I think Cabinet Secretary has uh, largely, largely covered it. Um, uh, as he mentioned in the opening statement, the hubs that we already have are, are each different you know they're, they're they're targeting things in different ways so you know comparing london and, and, and dublin would be comparing uh, uh, apples and oranges nevertheless we are trying within government to establish some sort of framework for evaluating the, the success of our hubs of, overall but i think the success we've already seen in dublin has given us the confidence that applying a, a similar model in uh, in um Berlin and now in, in Paris would be a sensible thing to do. Thank you. Can I just ask a couple of questions about the points you made in your opening remarks on the programme that's currently underway? Firstly, on um, superfast broadband, how much money is earmarked from the remainder of the budgets available for the delivery of the commitment on superfast broadband? That, that was the only question. Do you want to come back um, in that, the, David? The programme that we've currently had application for digital colleagues, we have allocated £20 million. That project is about to start. That's grant funding, so of course they would match in that. Uh, that money has yet to actually go out the door, so this is a project that's actually now starting. Um, we will then continue talking no, to them if but, they but want to. But the 100% commitment to, to every household in the country, and indeed business in the country, is way, I mean, the overall budget is way more than that from yeah. the Scottish Government, in yeah. fairness. So it's only going to be 20 million of European funding for towards that. And again, that. if it's because of it, sorry, I mean, it's because again some of the criteria. So it's very much it's in the Highlands and Islands. It's dealing with some of the less, far less accessible areas. So it's it's doing what it can within the rules that surround the European I funding. I and has the government decided yet as to whether it's going to procure that contract on a pan Scotland basis or in a number of uh, smaller areas? I think it's fair to say, and this comes obviously into Fergus Ewing's area rather than my own, but that is under active discussion just now. And the reason for that is because of the UK government's um, change or potential deal with BT, which, um, depending on how that's rolled out, will have an impact on Scotland. So the, the, the UK deal requires, I think, um, uh, 10, uh, a rate of 10 megabits, um, uh, whereas in Scotland we're trying to aim for 30. Now, mm. What we're trying to do is try and reconcile our procurement um, programme with what's going to happen from elsewhere, given that BT are a big partner for us. Mm. 
the bottom line is we could end up spending money abortively to achieve something to be achieved already by yeah. the UK government. But if it if it is achieved, whether well, it's achieved to the right speeds that we want to have as well. So that's why there's, it's actively being considered. This week I was involved in the discussion about it with uh, Fergus Ewing. It's actively being considered, and I think he'll have some clarity on that in the next few weeks. Some of us who live in the Wilds would be very grateful just to get 10, believe me, <laughs> never mind 30. But um, on the And also you mentioned, Mr Brown, the developing sovereignty on workforce investment. Mm -hmm. Did If I caught you right, you, you said said that the budget there would be allocated to SDS Schools Around Scotland and to the Scottish Funding Council. Are those the t only yeah. two recipients of European funding for that particular programme? No, they're not. I don't know if you want to give some... Uh, to the, the point it goes back to this, the way this programme has been designed. We are fin funding th those people as lead partners yeah. because they have the infrastructure to better deal with the audit requirements and procurement requirements. They are then pr passing that money out to far more um, recipients to actually do the delivery on the ground. I think it's fair to say that that particular strand in the previous round is one that gave us most problems in terms of the auditing because there were so many smaller um, projects that were undertaken. So that's why it's been, it is funneled through those, but many yeah. other recipients will benefit from yeah. it. OK, thank you. Um, and the final question I wanted to ask was about your remarks about the transition period. I mean, I take your, absolutely take your point about the uncertainty, but I guess the one thing we do know is the Prime Minister said there'll be, a, there'll be now a UK application for a two-year transition period, so t uh, 19 to 21. It's the post-21 scenario mm. that none of us know anything about. I mean, would it be fair to ask you to write to the committee at some stage with the options, at least, that, okay. that we understand? Because I took your point about the, this fund that the UK yeah. government may come up with, but, but I suppose for many of us who, as you said, have relied on this kind of funding, in the Highlands Islands over many, many decades, it looks to me like the proverbial cliff edge because I don't see where this funding comes from. And I wonder if, the, if Mr Brown would be prepared yeah. to write to the committee with at least the options as to where we might be in 2021. Uh, no, I think it's a very good point. And I'll write to you as far as I'm able to. I think there are huge uncertainties there. It's a UK shared prosperity fund that's being referred to as their measure or their means by which they can try and address inequality. Um, and they're also linking that into their industrial strategy. Mm. Um, but we have very little clarity just now. But yes, we'll give what um, um, uh, views that we can about the potential options post-2021. But just in relation to the point about the two-year transition, you, you're right to say, of course, the UK is now talking about that. That doesn't guarantee the EU will agree to that. So Indeed. that adds to uncertainty upon uncertainty. But I think the fundamental point, and it's probably more keenly felt, uh, as I'm sure Tavis Scott knows better than me, in the Highlands and elsewhere, the reliance on European funding now for decades which has done huge amounts of goods in the Highlands and Islands, not least when it had objective one status and the nuts two status, presents a real threat, I think, to the Highlands and Islands. And any, any views that we can give on that, we'll do that. We'll write back to the committee on that basis. Thank you. Thank you. Richard Lockhead, did you want to come in? Uh, thank you. Two quick questions. Firstly, <clears throat> when I visited the Murray Council's income maximisation unit recently, where a handful of staff work to ensure people get the benefits they're entitled to and navigate welfare reform, which is a very important role. And I very much welcome that unit. Uh, I learned that 50% of their funding is from Europe. So I was very interested to note that because I didn't know that. So I was wondering to what extent the government's capturing all these examples and anecdotes, particularly on a constituency basis, so MSPs are aware, uh, and if that exercise is underway. Um. I'm not sure it is done on a consistency basis, but I'm happy to look into that for the reasons that you suggest, bringing a greater focus to benefit uptake is a huge area, but um, I mentioned in my opening statement things around uh, financial inclusion and um, financial capacity, uh, if you like. Um, so I'm happy to look at that. It depends on the cost of doing that, I think, but I'm happy to look at that being done on a consistency basis. And presumably the point that uh, you're making is if you can then pass it on to MSPs, you might then be able to, um, a, you know, through publicity campaigns, increase the awareness of these uh, programmes. I know that in some people, individuals' cases, this can transform their lives if they get the right advice about what they're entitled to. So I'm happy to look at that, and if we can, um, provide it back on a consistency by consistency basis. Okay. My second question is, as a Highlands and Islands MSP representing Murray, uh, like Tavish Scott and others, I'm well aware of the positive impact the European regional policy has had on our communities over many years, and clearly today we've discussed the, the threat that the withdrawing from the EU poses to our communities. However, does that not now mean that there's an opportunity for Scotland to form its own regional policy? Because we will need a regional policy in Scotland if we want to promote economic development in the Highlands and Islands uh, and all corners of the country. Therefore, can I urge 
the Cabinet Secretary to, to seriously think about taking that forward, or perhaps it's the work's already underway? Mm. Uh, well, I think uh, there is work in a number of different areas which would contribute towards that, and maybe I could wrap that into the, the letter right back in relation to Tavi Scott's um, question about what the potential options are in future. But I do have to make the point that um, whatever programme you choose to, or measures you choose to bring forward, have to be underpinned by resources, and that is the fundamental question. If the resources currently used by the EU to assist um, a, a Scotland, and especially the more disadvantaged areas of Scotland, if those resources are not forthcoming post the EU situation, then that undermines whatever strategy you put in place. So that is the bigger question, that's the bigger uncertainty, and maybe it will be available through the Shared Prosperity Fund. So I will come back on that as far as I'm able to do that, although we have to know, the Scottish Government has to know what the shape and nature of this prosperity fund is if it's to be a replacement for these programmes before we can properly configure what we would do. Um, but I think you point, as does Tavis Scott, to the need for further thinking on this, even given the uncertainty, and we'll come back with where we're at uh, on that. Thank you. And I would just urge the, the Cabinet Secretary to define regional policies beyond funding uh, in terms of our policy directions have largely been dictated by e EU policy mm -hmm. in terms of regional policy in, in past decades. So we can form our own Scottish regional policy, which may include, for instance, all new civil service jobs are located mm -hmm. in all corners of Scotland. Uh, and there are other issues like that that could be included in a Scottish regional policy now that we have the opportunity to, or we're forced into having to develop our own regional policy. Yeah, I think part of that will be around things like city deals and other initiatives as yeah. well. Um, so happy to happy to do that. I'm just thinking who will get to do that, but we'll make sure we get something <laughs> back. <laughs> we've already we've already gone over time. We've got one last um, point of clarification, just, just I think, to, from Lewis really McDonald. Follow those answers to yeah. Travis Scott and Richard Lockett. The EU withdrawal bill, as it currently stands, means that these decisions are, will go back to Westminster. Mm. Is that correct? That's your interpretation as well. It, well yeah, I think that's the whole nature of the, the 111 yeah. discussion yeah. that Mike Nelson. So, so therefore, uh, my question, I guess, is, and, uh, and again, be helpful in, in the fuller response you're sending to the committee um, around this issue. What proposal will the Scottish Government put forward in terms of any future UK framework for regional development funding? Will it make a proposal for uh, simply freezing the shares as they currently exist? Will it make a proposal for a dynamic relationship depending on levels of development and underdevelopment, just to give us an idea of what it is the Scottish Government envisages for post-2021. Yeah, well, uh, notes have been taken of, of this. So this is going to be quite a fulsome letter, this, uh, when it comes back to the committee. <laughs> but, um, and, but it points to some very important issues. All I would say is that a lot of that work is currently done. We don't just rely on what the EU says it will fund. We have a number of other measures. I mentioned city deals, but a number of other things where we attach our own priorities to things. However, it is, uh, it's going to be foggy, at least, because if you have a, a UK measure, the shared prosperity, um, which I think seems to be their preferred method for replacing uh, EU funding, we, we, the Scottish Government, really have to know what the shape of that is, what the criteria are that are being applied before we can um, configure a response to that. It doesn't mean to say we're going to sit back and wait and find out what these things are before we get our own views across, but I think we do have to know that so you can know how to fill in the gaps. And, of course, the optimum position that would be um, uh, churlish of me not to say it for the Scottish Government is to have those resources ourselves so we can decide what the priorities are uh, within Scotland. And thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary, and I look forward to receiving your letter. Thank you. We'll very, suspend very briefly until the next witnesses to come in.
Our second item of business today is an evidence session on EU citizens' rights, and today's panel are all EU citizens living and working in Scotland and are members of the Fife Migrants Programme. Uh, oh, sorry, the Fife Migrants Forum, I do apologise. Uh, I'd also like to let you know that, uh, that this evidence session is being streamed on Facebook Live, so um, welcome to anyone who's engaging with the committee through Facebook. I think that's the first for the committee, so uh, I wanted to uh, let you all know that. Um, I'd like to welcome the panel of witnesses. Since we have a larger panel of witnesses than, than normal, it might be best if the witnesses uh, introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about uh, who they are and what they do. Uh, hello, my name is Eva Smarzyńska. I moved to Scotland uh, since 2010. Uh, my husband came here one year before me. Uh, I have two children. I am a worker and I am a student. And I live in Glen Office. Thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Roxana Dumitru. I'm from Romania. I uh, just got married in 2013. In 2014 was uh, an open market for Romanian and Bulgarian to come here for uh, having a new job. And uh, so being in a new family, I said, let's uh, have a new start and hopefully a better one. We have our family with us. We have two daughters. and. We are living uh, in Fife. We love here living and hope we will be for a long time. Uh, good morning, my name is Katarzyna Sławek. I'm a case worker in the Five Migrants Forum. I come to Scotland about 12 years ago, but, I, but I'm declared that Glen Rotes and Fife is my place and this is my home. Uh, every day I dealing uh, with the problems which actually we have it after Brexit, uh, when Brexit will affect it us. And uh, I'm a mother of two years old daughter. She has a British passport. I have a mortgage. What else you want to know? <laughs> uh, hello, my name is Victor. Uh, I'm from Spain. Been here for seven years now. Uh, work uh, since then. And still working and I just want to make sure that we can stay here for a long time. My name is Auxi Sousa, I'm also from Spain, I've been here seven years too. Um, I am married, I've got two kids, my mom lives with me, uh, I work, I'm going to college and I also want to stay here as, soon, as long as I can. I don't want to leave. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now, you, you, I'm sure you all have been uh, watching on television uh, the ongoing negotiations between the, the EU and the UK governments, and the status of EU citizens is a priority uh, for the EU, and the EU has said that they cannot move on to the next stage of talks until there is clarity on the, the status of EU citizens. But, of course, there is seems to be two different views of what uh, what level of reassurance uh, is is required to to uh, make people feel that the um, that their rights are being absolutely properly protected there still is a difference between the EU and the UK um, are you concerned about the state of the way negotiations are going or do you feel that you have are you happy with the announcements that the UK has has made about reassurances towards UK citizens. I don't know who wants to start. EU citizens, rather. We still don't know anything because it's not clear information to us that we have a right to reside up here permanently or no. And all what we want to know, it's we will we will not we lost in our houses. We don't lost our jobs. We don't lost our humans' right up here because. We don't want to be treating on different. We put so many contributions to this country, and we don't want to be discriminated on any point. Yes, it's true. Uh, what say Kasia? Because we still don't know what we have to do. We need clear information. What we have to do next? 
what will be next step. We every time we looking, we watch the TV. What what's happened? But still not happened. We still don't know. Lots of my friends have to, have to leave uh, Scotland because they don't see future because they don't know what next. Especially people who are here lo uh, less than five years. Yes. From two months, my friends, my uh, eight friends leave Scotland, my close friends, because they don't still know what happened. I am stuck because I don't know what I have to do next. I have to plan my future here, or I have to plan my study here. I have to, I don't know what I have to do now. The same my sons who who thinking about future here because they are 11 and 15. They don't know what, what will be next. They can't stay here on the can't, can't stay here. Right. Yes, even if you will be applying for the permanent residential card, it's not saving us enough. We not will be saved because the permanent residential card will be no longer valid after Brexit. That's the information what we had on the website. How we can protect each other? How we can protect our family? Yeah. Lisa, you want to yeah, I'm interested you say that. I mean, I, my understanding is that the, the, the legal right to, to remain permanently after five years is, is not contested and is not at risk. Um, but therefore, the question is, I guess, are people, are you and are other people applying um, to have that status recognised? And what is your experience in applying for that status to be recognised? Did you ever see this form? This form, it's about 80 pages. Mm -hmm. And they will ask you, can I ask you the question, Luis? Do you remember when you've been last time on holiday or 12 years ago? When you've been away on holiday for how long? Mm -hmm. Can you tell me this? I, that's a, well, it's a very good question. You're putting me right in the Because spot. they're asking ask about those questions. How, how many times I was away from, my can from this country, because this is my country. When, for how long, when I come back? They ask about any single of benefits, what we was claiming. That means if we was, if we claiming child tax credit, they asking how much, how long. If you, if somebody was on job seeker allowance, they ask exactly then how much, how long. Do you think that uh, we are able to provide this information? So, so the issue then is is having an accessible mechanism to make that application. Are you saying you've made that application, Katarzyna? Uh, I was helping and I've been trained for, for the yeah. Five Lot Center how to do this application, but I don't see any point to do this application if that application is not longer valid. Mm. It's cost for, all, for my, me and my husband because my daughter has a British citizen mm -hmm. already. It's just wasting the money. That's, that's 160, wasting the money. And I know a lot of people which actually was helping with to apply for this application before we had information that uh, application will be no longer valid after Brexit. Brilliant. And where did you get that information from? On the government website. OK. That's interesting. So um, it's true that um, we are still being able to be permanent residents in here. The thing is, that card, that permanent residency card, is not going to be valid after Brexit. So all the foreigners that paid for that card spent um, more than 120, 160 pounds. I know a friend who paid 360 pounds for the whole family. Um, he he's for just an example, has to pay for the new settle status. Mm -hmm. So what's the point of applying now or a few months ago for the permanent residency if it's not going to be longer valid if we have to apply again for a settle status? Ross Greer, did you want to come in? Yes, uh, thanks, Convener. I just wonder, what communication have you had directly from the UK government? have any communication. We have to look in on the newspapers, we have to look in on the government website. That's it. <clears throat> we don't have any letter from government that your rights are saved and even up here when I was applying for my passport for my daughter, when I have to provide all the documents from last 11 years, it's no matter. 
I'm still not safe up here. I'm working, and I was work up here since I coming here. And uh, what will be if I will be, if something will be happening to me, or I have to lost my job, or I will lost my job. What will be? What will be happened? And we've heard anecdotes of uh, European citizens living here who are now struggling to uh, get tenancies because landlords aren't convinced that they'll be able to, to guarantee that they're staying here, they, uh, they're unable to get mortgages, struggling to, to get new jobs. Are those anecdotes accurate in your experience and from the experience of people uh, you know? I have a few clients which actually was coming and spoke about mortgages because people are worried to take a mortgage and I know it's few banks already was rejected the application just because I guess because of the immigrant status. Because of this immigrant status so most of uh, the employers will start to think twice or more than twice if uh, it's a right thing to take a immigrant as an employee or to take uh, someone else from outside of Europe or uh, a, Brit a British is not an issue to take it or not, but it's this, shall I have this one who is already here, or shall I uh, make a, an announce uh, outside of, uh, for it? Mm. Uh, yeah. At this point, if an employer got two candidates, one is from Europe, one is from outside Europe, I believe 80% of the times is going to be for the one is outside Europe because they are regulated, they got the visas, they got the, the provider for, for work. So the problem is going to be for us after Brexit. There's no employer that's going to take us because I don't think it's going to be nothing ready. And, oh. and it's not going to be just after Brexit, it's during the negotiations. Mm -hmm. uh, just now, there is nothing clear. There is nothing clear about what's going to happen with us. Uh, what kind of paperwork we are going to need to stay in here, if we are going to need just the settled status or we are going to need something else, uh, if we are going to need to prove something to the employers. And it's not just to protect us, it's also to protect the employers. The employers need protection, needs to be, um, needs to, to, to have clear that they can hire someone from the EU. And um, it's not, it's also about being comfortable to hide someone from the EU that knows that he's not going to leave the, that, that job. That after one month or two months, they're going to have to rehire someone. Um, yeah. This was exactly my situation when I applied about a new job uh, to a huge company. And uh, I am here five, was here five years, and a uh, lady who has interviewed with me asked me about permanent resident card. I told, a, I told her I don't have to, because I not applied, because I don't have to apply. She told me I can't, she can't give me this job because she don't know how long I can stay here. So she spent time on a training me, she spent time on a, you know, Everything what is what is for new uh, new employer and now next somebody told no you can't uh, employ people from U union and she have to throw out me uh, from work so uh, I think um, employer feel not comfortable because they don't know what what will be next what will be next what have to um, because we haven't resident card my application is at home really at home. I have to change this application three times because three times was changed. Uh, I was updating, so uh, I can't uh, fill this form alone. I need uh, help, a lawyer, because normal people isn't don't understand everything. So we really have to spend money from lawyer to apply for this application. And now I hear that this permanent resident card will be uh, worried. So I can't find new job because many many employers don't know what what next. So I stay in my job. I love my job really, but uh, I need some extra. For example, uh, next job, extra jobs. But lots of lots of employer has problem because don't know what what next. And uh, just finally, if time, can you 
What effect is this having on, a number of you mentioned you have children, what effect is this having on your children, this uncertainty? Because it's uncertain, we don't know what's going to happen with them. And that's what we all want. Mm. I said earlier, um, I commented earlier, I, I don't mind what happened with us. If we have to leave, we have to leave. If Britain doesn't want us, I don't want to be in some place that they don't want me. All I want is to protect my kids. They are just six and two. And if you ask them, if you, if you ask the older, where are you from? He's not gonna tell you where is he from, but if you are asking something about Spain, he's gonna tell you that Spain is some place to go for holidays. So he's not from Spain. He, he just knows that we are going to Spain for holidays, that's it. So we don't know what's gonna happen with them. My kids don't, doesn't have a British passport, they have a Spanish passport. I don't know if I can apply for the British citizenship uh, for them. Um, I don't know what's gonna happen with the school. I don't know nothing because there is not information. There is not a letter from the UK government to us saying don't worry, uh, we'll give you more information or um, updating us about something. There is nothing clear, nothing at all. Thank you. Well, to another uh, cities because we bought a house. Uh, we moved from Kikodi to Glen Rafes, and my son had to move, to, uh, change a school. And first day, his new friends asked him, "Where are you from?" He told, "I am from Kikodi," because he don't understand he's from Poland, because his life, his old life, is here. He spent here seven years. He has, uh, he was uh, two years old when he came here, and he don't know different life. We, of course, spent a uh, holiday, spent uh, Christmas or something like that in Poland, but his whole life is here. So he isn't from Poland, he's from uh, Glen Rofes, uh, from Kirkaldi, sorry. <laughs> so. Thank you. It's how it goes. Thank you. Um, I think most of us would think the situation you're in is utterly intolerable in terms of the uncertainty. But the, the question I wanted to ask was, in terms of the case you've made about that uncertainty, have you used your MPs who obviously uh, sit in the House of Commons down in London where and therefore can make the case directly to the UK government ministers who are responsible for this uncertainty? Have you used that, that channel to, to, make, uh, to point these, these things out? Yes, we had on Five Migrants Forum, we have a few events with them and we was, of course, explain our worries as well. But since this, they cannot give us answer as you cannot give me. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so nothing happens as a, because there's no answers, no certainty from the UK government about this. Yeah. And have you been invited at any stage to talk directly to the UK government, whether to, to, um, you know, to officials, to civil servants, or directly to ministers? I think we had a secretary of the minister last few weeks ago, okay. two weeks and ago. we was yes. we was talked directly today. To and you made to this, these yes. points to them, like, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you feel you had a got a sympathetic hearing? Did you know? Uh, it's very hard question for me because it's part of my work to be up here. Yeah. And as I tell you, I don't feel immigrant up here because I feel that I belong to Scotland mm. and I belong to my small town, Glenrothes, when I'm stay from last 12 years. And uh, I know that people would like to help us, but they are hopeless with, with this because the main government. <laughs> no, we understand the reasons why. I mean, it's a negotiation yes, and that's ongoing. And, yeah. uh, you just want it to be finished. But yeah. our feeling, it's lots of people has depression. Our feeling is like we don't know what will be happened. Mm. And imagine just sleeping with, with the feeling that you have a mortgage, you have a, yeah. your small daughter, which actually she she don't know anything from my country. She she she's just growing on this culture and everything. She don't have any other friends that that yeah, friends from the street and yeah. neighborhood. And just imagine my worries on the night. What will be if I cannot work? I cannot pay my mortgage. I cannot make her a future. Hmm. 
And what will be with me if she, she can't, she will be stay up here because I was not apply for the Polish citizen for her if she has a British passport mm. because I don't see a point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she will stay up here and I have to go mm. to my country. Mm. I'm just, I'm really confused. And, and uh, my job, it's working with the people and every day the people coming with worries about the Brexit and what will be happened. And does not help as well. <laughs> Want to come in? So, yeah, I personally emailed two weeks ago my MP, my local MP, and um, because I heard about the settler status, I, it was the first time I heard that the, the, the permanent residency card is not going to be valid after Brexit. So, I wanted to contact him to see if he can give me some advice about. If it's true, if it's not true, what can I do? If I should wait, if I shouldn't wait, um, he never replied. So, yeah, we we have tools and we use them, mm. but I I really believe that if they don't have answers, mm. how can they answer us? Mm. That's mm. the problem. We've all, we're all in that position exactly. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, Richard Lockhead. Thank you. <coughs> I just wanted to explore where you get your information from, because it strikes me it's a very complex picture and there's ongoing negotiations, and you were saying that you get some of your information from the newspapers. Is there anything you think could be put in place to give you more support to make sure you're getting constant, updated, authoritative information in terms of what the status is and also how the negotiations are progressing? Is there, I'm just, I, I just sense from people in my own constituency and from what you're saying today that it's very difficult for people to get accurate, reliable information. Um, I, don't, I, I think we just need information, really uh, information on a 100% what we have to do. Because every negotiation don't give us nothing new. Everything is stuck in one one place. This is, of course, my opinion. But um, we need on a 100% what we have to do. Just one decision, which told us what we have to do next. Okay. I was just thinking whether there should be a national service that people can sign up to and get a weekly update or something. I just was trying to think through. Sign to the government website, and then you, just, you have the news. Just, just this, just, just this way. Okay. That what we're doing. Yes. There is a lot of information on um, on um, I, I have to say names. Sorry, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. Um, and um, I don't know, and I want to believe that the government knows which are the migrants and from where we are coming from. So if they, if they have a database, um, maybe they can send a letter to confirm the new movements, if um, they have a, an agreement about uh, about this, about don't get the permanent residency or, or get it, but take in mind that this is going to be changed. For example, if I've got a letter saying that, I don't save money for the permanent residency, and I will wait for the settled status. That's, that's what I'm doing now. I, I took away the idea of taking the permanent residency just for waiting. Um, if there is, a, if the application for the settled status is open, I don't know. I have to find out. So why I don't get a letter or an email saying, I know you're from Spain or you are from EU, and this is open. We are offering you this. We think that you are able to get it. Um, here is the information. Um, if, if there is any other. Um, uh, agreements with the EU or between MPs or whatever, if there is any other decision that they know that they are going to do it after Brexit, they should tell us instead of for us finding us on Facebook, newspaper, televisions, or word of, of mouth, because always it's going to be a rumor. Exactly. Well, I think that's certainly something that should be pursued by the authorities. My, my second question is, clearly, <clears throat> we hope you feel welcome in Scotland and we rely on people moving to Scotland because we need 
the people's uh, contribution and skills in this country. Uh, so we rely as a nation on people moving to Scotland. So many people in Scotland are upset by what's happening just now. But in terms of some of the anecdotes, I know that from speaking to certain people I hear that EU nationals are now wanting to move away from Scotland or UK. They're hearing about friends and family who are going to come here but have now changed their mind and are going elsewhere. I just wanted you to perhaps elaborate on your experience, uh, you know, from people you're speaking to who've perhaps moved to Scotland. Thank you. Previous question. The Home Revenue already have all the information about your time, when you, how long you are here and how many years you have a contribution to this country. That means it's easy to find for them. And even when you uh, have your uh, personal account on the Home Revenue, it already show you the year of the contribution, the year of the works. That means it's easy to for the government just to decide that which one which one of us, it's, you know, has a right to reside, which no. At uh, the same, they have information how many times we went away from the country and for how long. Uh, the second question is, uh, yes, we already have it that uh, from IVA's classes, eight, eight of families decided not to come back to Scotland after holiday. On my work, I have uh, about seven families which actually they moving to other countries as well because they are not feel safety up here. In my work as well, they are asking me what it will happen to them. Shall they uh, prepare to pack from 2019 to move back to Romania or thinking about moving somewhere else? What will be their status here? Because. Uh, we all came here uh, believing in some rights, and uh, we got some rights here, and after the Brexit will start, uh, it's like, uh, you know, having a dog, you have it for Christmas, and sorry, I don't have enough space for you, I have to send you away to, a, to another house. Um, on my work, there are a lot of EU citizens that are deciding to leave because they don't know what is their future in, in here. Um, there are a few already that left and there are another few that are saving to leave because obviously if you're going to start a new life you need the money to start that life. Um, I personally been here for seven years. My both kids have born in here, one in London and the other one in, in Kirkodi. I refuse to live. I don't want to live. My country is getting better now. That's what I hear. Um, I want to believe that I, any family can have a kind of good life in there, but I refuse to live. This is my house. And I left in, I, we used to live in London for two years uh, when we first came to the UK. Um, and we moved after two years to Dunfermline. Uh, we feel welcome in here. And uh, th this is so different to London. Uh, we are so comfortable in here. I don't want to leave. This is my house, this is my place. And, and, my, my kids are here, they have their friends, they have their schools. So there is no point for me to start a new life from zero in another country. Spain is just the, the country I was born. I don't feel Spanish anymore. Yeah. And I've got Stuart McMillan wants to come in. Are you finished, yeah, yeah, Richard Lockhead? Yeah. Yeah. Can, can, can I ask, uh, 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 imagine you were in a position, as, as we hope to be in the next few weeks, where we have in front of us David Davis, who is the chief negotiator for the UK government uh, in Brussels and negotiating the detail of Brexit. What would you say to him? What is the answer to the questions that you've highlighted so effectively this morning? Is the answer simply for the British government to accept that European Union citizens who are here should continue to have all the rights they that you currently have on the same basis that you currently have them. Is that essentially what you would want to see uh, as the British government's position in negotiating with Europe? Yes. As, as she said before, uh, 
the government already knows who Europe citizens are here working, paying taxes, having a life, and who not. So we are here to make UK better. So and the they know that. The uncertainty people feel would be removed if the UK government simply said, people who are here now will continue to have the same rights they have had up until yeah. now. That would be much better for us. Okay. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, good morning. Uh, I think the evidence that we've heard from yourselves has been extremely powerful, and I want to thank you for that. Uh, I want to take you back just to the reasons that you came uh, to Scotland and, and the UK in the first place, and, and the whole issue of the uh, of free movement uh, within the European Union as to how beneficial uh, you've actually felt that has been uh, for yourselves, but also for friends and family. So um, we are married. Um, we got married in 2010, and I just finished my college. He was unemployed for almost two years, and we didn't have any we didn't have any plan to, to come to the UK. Um, I was planning to, to have a job in there, uh, about what I had a study, and uh, one day him and my mom sat me on the sofa and said, you have to leave because it's not fair for him to be unemployed for this long time. Spain was in a very bad time, and um, even though I had the hope to find a job on what I studied, um, there was nothing certain. So we were looking for um, places to decide which country, because we, we could move anywhere. Um, I had a sister living in London already, uh, but uh, we preferred to move to Germany or, or to Norway. Uh, but the language was easier. And it was easier because we had my sister in here. So um, it was just, OK, language, we don't speak English, but we can understand something. And it's going to be easier because we've been studying English uh, for the, the all, every single school year. Um, let's go to my sister. And uh, she welcomed us on her house. Um, in two weeks, we had a job, one of us. Um, just simple as that, two weeks when he'd been unemployed for two years. Um, and after two years in London, we decided that it was too much. It was too big. It was too stressful and a very long period of time traveling to go to work and come back. So we decided to, do, to look for something else because it isn't just stressful or whatever. The, the impact of, on us is just the future of my son on that city so big with so many people. Um, so he found a job in here in Amferland. So um, we decided to move. And that was already five years ago. And we don't regret any single movement. Um, if I could go back now to my country, maybe. I would be welcoming there. No. Um, I'm getting my qualifications in here. Um, I must. HNC accounting in here, and um, the law in there is different. So I'm not going to be able to be an accountant in there. Um, that's why I, I moved in here. It was easier for my my sister and the kind of knowledge of English. Um, most of the people, when, when we moved, asked us, did you came for the benefits? No. I don't receive any benefit, any. We had our son the 24th of August, 2011. And one year after, we heard that we could apply for working tax and child tax. I didn't even know that. We didn't know that we had right to have benefits. OK. It's been told. We've been told a thousand times uh, we don't need to work. We got two childs, and yes, the government pay for the childs. We don't have to work because the government is going to pay for everything. I refuse to do that. 
I came here to make a life of myself, my family. What are we gonna do sitting at home all day? Exactly. <laughs> it's gonna be too boring. <laughs> no, no, that is not for me. I was came up here because I finished my uni and I cannot find a normal, well-paid job. Twelve years ago in Poland, and uh, I cannot afford pay the rent for my house. And my mommy has a cancer, and she needs a support as well. I was came up here and I start to work. Day after when I came up here, I had an interview and I had a job one of the hotels. And I was working 80 hours a week for two years to have some money for me, save some money to buy a house up here, and rest money to send was sent to Poland to help my mommy with to survive. She's fine just now, but was a long time. I was uh, I was unemployed up here just for one and a half months, mm -hmm. but from twelve years I was working up here all the time, and the contribution up here and the job of the community, what contribution to the community, what we doing? It's amazing because I start conversation cafe. It's a part of my uh, job as well, which actually was helping people to learn English and helping people to the community. And just imagine situation when on this small room, you have uh, more Scottish people coming that people which actually was belong to this conversation cafe because they feel so happy to talk with us. They are supporting us with the bad feeling about the Brexit. And it's amazing. It's amazing. But the other way, we still don't know what will be happened. Um, if, if, if others, witnesses don't want to come in, I've got Mary uh, Gujon wants to ask a question. Do yes, you? Uh, thank you so much for coming along today and for telling us about your experience. And I'm so glad to hear in your last response there that you know you do feel supported in that way. And uh, yeah, I couldn't help but feel angry and frustrated as well. You know, uh, like when you talked about uh, being asked if you came for the benefits. And I think that that's one element of this whole conversation which really angers me. Um, because, well, first of all, as if our benefits are all that generous anyway as a country, I think that's one thing. Um, but really, it's just in terms of your sense of being here. Um, and would you say that has, has your view of Scotland or the UK changed since the referendum? Um, I know that you say a lot of you, you want to stay here and it's your home. Um, have your opinions of Scotland or the UK as, as a whole changed since all this? To be honest, um, before the Scottish referendum uh, to leave UK, I was hoping Scotland don't leave UK because remaining to the EU. And now I, was ho I am hoping to get another referendum to get rid of the UK and be <laughs> part of the EU again. Um, yes, my, my, my view of UK has changed a lot. Um, as I said earlier, um, if I'm not welcome, I'm not going to stay. That's why I want to stay in, in Scotland. I don't want to go back to England. Um, I don't want to leave Scotland. Uh, Scottish people are really friendly and um, they are real people. They, they're humans and um, they treat us as equals. And when I was living in London, that didn't happen. I didn't know my neighbors. And um, we couldn't have friends because everyone was so busy. Um, in here, we have friends, we, uh, and Scottish friends, uh, is friends from other countries, from the EU, from outside the EU. Um, here, you can make a life. And that's the change. I, on my view that I have made is, um, is uh, please, it's got to leave UK. <laughs> Does anyone else want to come in on that question? No, just a <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, sorry. No, yeah. only go. Um, 
would like thank you. Uh, I don't know Richard probably who welcome us because I really don't long time I he I didn't hear these words because when I come here I feel I was proud that I can use my language wasn't problem nobody looks on me like I don't know from but now uh, really I avoid using my language between other people because I feel they think I don't come I don't want come be here. I don't know I could explain. Uh, because I think, uh, because we speak about this, um, when somebody go to what, vote, vote and decide to leave a, a, a Union, Euro, uh, European Union, thinking this day every uh, immigrant move to their country. And they feel, uh, Scottish people or uh, British people feel um, frustrated because this not happened. And they uh, probably uh, not feel good with us because we are still here. Oh, thank you very much thank for you. that. Um, I can only imagine how frustrating it is to see negotiations on each side and knowing that you can't have any say in that. And it's pretty much determined by, you know, the, we'll have the negotiator on the EU side, we'll have the UK government, and that's, you just have to wait and see what comes out of that. Um, but I was just wondering, I mean, have you had, a, do you look at the different negotiating positions between the two areas? And I suppose, what are the specific are there specific points in particular or specific areas you want to see protected or things that you feel like on either negotiating side haven't been considered or things that you know need to be uh, discussed in further detail? I just want to, to remain here the same I am now. Mm -hmm. I don't want to pay for a visa. I don't want to, an employer have to pay a, a, a working visa for me because they want me to stay here. I don't want that to happen. I want to still have free to decide if I want to stay here or if I want to go somewhere else. I just don't want that to change. Mm -hmm. Question: We had a panel of lawyers here uh, last week um, who talked about this matter, and some of them identified some specific aspects of the negotiations that could cause problems. And one of the things that they said was that the UK government was suggesting that to apply for settled status, European citizens would have to show a passport. Uh, many European citizens don't use passports, they use identity cards. Is that something that's emerging as a as a problem? Yeah, probably. Just uh, uh, for in Spain, we go, both of them, we can have a passport, we can have an ID card, and we can travel with both of them, no problem, within Europe. But if I have to pay for a... If I, if I have to, get, to choose, I'm going to choose the ID card, basically because it's cheaper. I don't want to pay the extra money for the passport mm -hmm. because I don't want to use it, as, at least now. I don't want to get outside Europe. I don't have plans to go okay. abroad. And we just cannot have but a Scottish passport. <laughs> <laughs> um, when talking about um, what we want to see from those um, mm. I want to see them to discuss about us as people, as real humans, not as a number I want to get down, not as I've got I don't know how many millions of uh, migrants and I want to reduce them on I don't know how many percent. We are real people with real life, with real problems and with real works, with real jobs. And my boss is a real boss with a real company and if he lose me, he's going to have to find someone else. So we have to protect everything, not just the migrant or the British. We have to protect everything. And um, that's something I really appreciate from today, that you guys are taking your time to listen to us and to see our own problems on our life. Um, and that's something the British government should do that too. Sit with a few migrants from the EU and listen to them to see what kind of problems they are looking at, what kind of 
future, they are looking for the, the migrants. Okay. The, the other issue that's come out in terms of the negotiations is that the, the UK government have not given a cut-off date for when uh, settled status could apply. Um, and I know the EU have been pressing them to name a cut-off date, but they have not done so. Is that something that's of concern uh, to people in your organisation? John, just imagine how many immigrants we have in the Scotland and the all UK, and imagine if all these people will be applied on the one time for this mm -hmm. application. Yeah. <laughs> but I need to say something else about this because I think it will be a disaster, to be honest. The same was what was happened with the permanent residential card because they already have so many forms to check and they're stuck. Yeah. Eva, did you want to respond to I that know, point? I similar like Same Kasia, point. yes. Um, yes. Yeah. And finally, the other difference uh, between uh, the EU and the UK in terms of these negotiations is that the EU wants, uh, in, if they get a settlement, they want citizens, EU citizens in this country, uh, they want their rights to be upheld by the European Court of Justice, whereas the UK government is saying that they want the British courts uh, to rule on those rights, but with guidance, looking at the looking at European law, but they want it to be decided in British courts. Is it important to you that your rights are still protected by the European Court of Justice? In my country, the Strasbourg Tribunal is very important because of the political situation political situation has changed so many times and the influences to their courts are especially just now very huge and uh, if we want to fight the Strasbourg fin uh, tribunal is just the last hope for us I don't mean I don't meet very people up here which actually using the Strasbourg tribunal in Scotland against the courts up here I don't mean even no. I don't know which difference could do to us because I'm not planning to use it. Yeah. Um, I don't know anyone ha that have used it. So mm -hmm. uh, one thing I would like to say, uh, I don't know, maybe that uh, both ha help in, in, on that moment. When the Barcelona attack, um, the terrorist attack uh, um, last month, uh, we were there. We were just 40 minutes away. So we called the um, the council the, the the UK consular on uh, Barcelona, um, they couldn't help because we are not British, and I I was uh, in contact with um, Spanish with, with Spain, and they couldn't help because I'm I'm not Spanish I'm residency here in in the UK so I am belong to nowhere, mm -hmm. so if if I want help somewhere outside of the UK, I cannot get help. So that's something that it really needs to be checked. I don't know if, if it's something to do the Brexit or, or not, but that needs to be checked. I don't have a permanent resident card because I know it's not going to be valid after Brexit, and I'm waiting for the settled status, so I don't have nothing to prove that I live in here. But that needs to be checked. Mm -hmm. We need to be protected out of the UK. That sounds like an issue with the present position. And so I'm curious to understand what it was that you were trying to get from the Spanish government as a EU citizen in Spain that they weren't able to give you. So basically it was um, to see if we were protected where we can travel, where we couldn't travel. We went on holidays. So Everything we had was on news and on media. It wasn't nothing clear. So who were you asking for advice? The police or...? In Spain, it, mm. it was the police uh, at the moment, uh, the, the Mossos. Um, and the only thing they could say, if you're going to Barcelona, don't go uh, by car. That's mm. the only thing. Um, but then we had to take the plane two days after. So we wanted to, to know if we needed more time because there are more checks or anything, something. We wanted to know something. Um, 
and there was no place. Um, we were from nowhere. The reason I'm asking is because I guess my earlier question was, do you want to maintain the rights you currently have? But if you're describing a situation where your current status creates a difficulty, uh, that clearly raises some other questions about the yeah. EU. It was a very difficult moment. And yeah, sure. I know that this is a very difficult question because of that, because I don't belong to anywhere when I'm out of the UK because I cannot prove that I am living in the UK. I just have a Spanish passport, but I don't live in there. Rachel Hamilton, did you have a question? Yes, thank you. It's, it's changing the sub subject slightly, but thank you for coming along today. Um, uh, we know that the hospitality and the agricultural sector are very reliant on migrant labour, and I just wanted to ask you um, if your, your friends or your family um, work in seasonal labour and how you believe that I mean, you, you all have uh, pretty much settled status. You've lived here for quite a long time, um, all of you, po possibly over five years, as I, I made some notes at the start. But how do you believe that, you know, migrant labour is going to work in the future for um, the seasonality of agriculture and hospitality, particularly in Fife? Well, we already have a... Uh, uh contact with a uh, few farms and hotels on the five, which actually they're asking about people to work and they don't have nobody mm. because people just decided to move or decided to have, you know, like a work on different area on the more, more safety place for their status. Uh, my colleague from my work, Colm, he was on hospital, and the five person which actually was going to care of him was immigrants. And I just cannot imagine situation on one day, I hope it's never hap never will be happened, but one day when all the immigrants just not will be coming to a job, and what will be happened with this country, what will be happened with Great Britain? Because We are everywhere. We working on the hospitals. We working on the farms. We working on the uh, on the uh, one house. We working on the shops. We work everywhere. Mm. The nurse, the cleaner, somebody who it pick up your food for you, who produce the food. That most of these people they are migrants. Okay. And I just cannot imagine one day if people just give up and we'll be going on the strike and this country will be stopped. I just cannot imagine the situation. I remember the situation, uh, I don't know, maybe last, last year, when on a Facebook was information, uh, one day we're not coming, immigrants not coming to work. And how many, how many immigrants don't coming to work? Everybody come. Because we protect, we care about our job, our, uh, because we, uh, we feel respect. Because you welcome us, you give us uh, possibilities, so we respect everything. So nobody from immigrants stop at this work, this day work. Everybody come to work. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, we're now slightly over time, um, and I'm going to draw this evidence session to a close. Uh, can I once again thank you all very much for taking the time to come here? I know, as we've heard, you're all very hard-working people, and you've had to take time off your work to attend this committee session, so we do very much appreciate it. And just to reiterate what other members of the committee said, that you are very welcome in Scotland, and certainly this committee will be working hard to try to get answers uh, for some of the questions that you've raised here today. So thank you very much again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can I just thank you very much as a Five Migrants Forum member and guys if you want to if you would like to come and see how we're working and the problems with every people lives, you are welcome on our office as well. Thank you very much thank for you. that invitation. <laughs> well have a brief suspension. <laughs>